as you can hear from my accent, I'm not a real Sabra Israeli. Uh, I made Aliyah from Australia almost in a couple of weeks. It'll be five years ago. And as you probably know, um, the idea of Aliyah is that Jews can go to Israel and become citizens, anyone who has at least one Jewish grandparent. Um, this is the law of return. It was one of the first laws passed by the new Israeli government uh, after the founding of the state. And it is something that is extremely unique to Israel. Um, I think it's, it's known that uh, the state of Israel is an anomaly to the last 2,000 years of Jewish history. But what it really means in a very practical sense is that Jews no longer have to be refugees. That if there are Jews who are in, um, in danger, they can go to Israel. And the thing about it is, as soon as they arrive in Israel, they are no longer refugees. Because the definition of a refugee is someone who is outside of their country and is seeking asylum from persecution. But when a Jewish person arrives in Israel, they don't have to explain their, uh, the persecution they are fleeing in order to apply for refugee status. They say, I'm here, I'm making Aliyah under the law of return. And that's the end of the story. They become citizens of the state of Israel. And so it doesn't matter if you're fleeing persecution or you're like me who had a good life in Australia and, and came to Israel out of um, pull factors, not push factors. Um, the law of return brings us uh, to be equals to be citizens in the state of Israel. And for most of Jewish history, for most of Israeli history, uh, the law of return has been the adequate migration policy for the state of Israel. For most of the, 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 uh, the states, it hasn't really been brought into question at all. Um, at the same time as Israel uh, passed the law of return, uh, the UN also passed the UN Refugee Convention um, in 1951. The Refugee Convention came directly out of the Holocaust, and it said anyone who is fleeing persecution and is seeking asylum based on the grounds of race, religion, nationality, or political opinion, they should have the right to flee, to go to another country and say, I'm fleeing persecution, please give me protection and safety. In 1951, Israel was one of the first countries to sign this convention, and it made complete sense. At the time, Israel said, oh, that is exactly the situation a lot of Jewish people in Europe were in. They fled, countries said, no, we don't want you. And that was the end of them. And it made sense. So Israel signed the Refugee Convention. Today's scenario of the State of Israel was so far from what they could even imagine in 1951. We're talking about not long after the Independence War, Israelis on food rations, um, a fridge is an absolute luxury. It was a radically different time. Anyway, so early 50s, you have the Refugee Convention, you have the Law of Return, those two things are completely separate um, and in no way in conflict. Um, in the 1970s, uh, the first opportunity for Israel to take in refugees happened. Um, there was an Israeli uh, shipping uh, ship um, traveling in the S China Sea, and they came across a boatload of Vietnamese refugees who were fleeing the Vietnam War. And the Israeli ship captain took the Vietnamese refugees on board. They were they had they were on a boat that was leaky. They had no more food and water. And he arrived and saw the opportunity uh, to save them. And they contacted back the Israeli government, and it was 1977. Menachem Begin had just become the first Likud prime minister in Israeli history, and one of his first acts as prime minister was to grant residency to these uh, Vietnamese. 
And he said at the time, we have never forgotten the boat with 900 Jews having left Germany in the last weeks before the Second World War, traveling from harbor to harbor, from country to country, crying out for refuge. They were refused. Therefore, it was natural to give these people a haven in the land of Israel. Uh, those Vietnamese refugees were uh, assisted. They were given housing in the north of Israel. And uh, they became Israeli. They didn't become Jewish. They became Israeli. Um, we have a few clients who are ours now, our clients now who come to the office to renew their uh, residency permits, um, children of these Vietnamese refugees, um, two of them, they're officers in the Israeli army today. And so other than these um, completely unique incident, um, the law of return and Israel's migration policy didn't really come into conflict at all until early 2006. In 2006, the first group of refugees from Darfur, Sudan, arrived on the Israeli border. Um, they'd gone through the uh, Sinai Desert in Egypt and they arrived in Israel and said, we're from Darfur, we're looking for protection. What had happened was there were a lot of uh, Sudanese refugees in Egypt and Egypt started doing the one most basic thing that is against the refugee convention, which is returning people to their source of danger. They began, they, they signed a deal with uh, Sudan and started returning refugees from Sudan um, in Egypt back to Sudan, including those from Darfur who had fled the genocide. The Darfuris protested uh, in the middle of Cairo outside the offices of the UNHCR. And after a few days of protest, the Egyptian army opened fire on the unarmed protesters um, in the middle of Cairo. And that was the, um, the catalyst for the Darfuris in Egypt to say, this isn't safe anymore, we can't stay here anymore. And they looked at the map and they saw on the other side of the Sinai Desert is Israel. And they heard that this was a country that had democracy and human rights. Many of them had heard about the Holocaust and they thought that perhaps in Israel there would be a sympathetic audience for them. And on December 31st, uh, 2005, the first group arrived on the border. And when they arrived, the people who they met were the soldiers, because it's the border of Israel. It's hard to imagine, but there's not really um, much of a border there. There was a small fence, but essentially the uh, Israeli border is just an armistice line from the Yom Kippur War in the 70s with uh, Egypt. And so it was easy to overcome the fence, and they would enter Israel. And they arrived, and the Israeli army picked them up. And it took a while until it was formulated as a policy. But the very first group of Darfuris, the first 500, were granted residency status in Israel. Um, at the time, the Minister of Interior said, Israel, with its history, must offer assistance. It can't stand by and shut its eyes. He's a Minister of Interior for under the Likud government um, in 2007 when the decision was finally made to give them status, um, that there is Eliza Olmert, uh, the, the wife of Hood Olmert, who was the prime minister at the time of, from Kadima. And what's interesting about this quote is the way he says Israel with its history. There's a clear identification between Jewish history and the people from Darfur and what they were fleeing. There was an acknowledgement that in there is a similarity. And it's an interesting point to, no to note out because from that time until today, we can track a dramatic change in the discourse from these people are refugees and that is common with our history to a language of which is they're everything but refugees and completely denying that any kind of equivalency has happened there. The more refugees in Egypt heard that Israel was a safe place and they started to come. 
including people from Eritrea. Um, I don't know if you know much about the country of Eritrea. I certainly didn't before I started working in this field. Eritrea is described as the North Korea of the Middle East. It's one of the reasons we don't know a lot about this country is because there is not a lot of information that leaves and goes in and out of the country. Um, since it got its independence from Ethiopia in 1993, it's been ruled by one dictator who has been in power since then. There's no freedom of speech, there's no freedom of association, there's no free media. And the thing that is most harsh for Eritreans is the national service. So everyone is recruited into the, into the army, but unlike con other countries that have um, forced conscription, like Israel, there's no end date. People end up working as slaves for 10 or 20 years to the government. The country is no longer at war. A lot of people in the army are literally slaves to the government, building roads, um, infrastructure, um, under extremely harsh conditions. And for anyone who uh, expresses any kind of dissent, um, it's known that Eritrea is a place that has more underground jails than anywhere else. And um, many people who fled from Eritrea were people who had originally believed in their country, had wanted to go to the army, and then at some point they maybe wanted a weekend off to visit their family or uh, they needed extra support to support um, you know, their, their sister who had a baby and were not allowed out of the army. And from there it turned into a cycle of violence and understanding that they were essentially enslaved to the government. And Eritrea has what's called a shoot-to-kill policy at the border. People aren't, allev aren't allowed to leave the country. Um, when they do, it's normally at night time, they creep across the border, and the soldiers are taught to shoot to kill. So a common story you hear from an Eritrean asylum seeker is that uh, three of us uh, prepared to cross the border one night, um, the guards started shooting at us, one guy fell, two of us kept running, I don't know what happened to the other guy. It's, uh, it, it was part of, e yeah, it was part of <laughs> Ethiopia and it has a border with Sudan as well. Um, and then therefore right next to Egypt. Um, so in 2007, the first Eritreans started coming. And for a good six years between 2006 and 2012, the government watched people arrive. They watched, they talked, they didn't do anything. And so what would happen was people would arrive, they would be picked up by the army when they had crossed into the country, and they would be taken to immigration detention because the law that was in place was the entry to Israel law. It's the same law that governs tourists or migrant workers coming in, and it says anyone who doesn't have a valid visa can be detained until they're deported. So they would pick them up and take them to immigration detention. But when the detention center was filled, they needed to release people. And so the question of what to do with them essentially fell to the prison authority. And the prison authority said, well, it's just our job to get them out of prison. So they released them from prison with two things. One was called a 2A5 conditional release visa, which basically just released them from prison and said that they, would, uh, they are released on the condition that when their deportation is possible, they will comply. And they gave them a bus ticket to Tel Aviv. And for six years, the immigration absorption policy for these refugees was a bus ticket to South Tel Aviv. And when they got there, they found a park, and that was it. There was no housing, there was no welfare services, there was no social workers, there was no health services whatsoever. And in those years, particularly between 2010 and 2012, when many people arrived, uh, Levinsky Park in South Tel Aviv turned into a pseudo-refugee camp. It's hard to imagine in a developed country the idea of sending 60,000 homeless asylum seekers to one already disadvantaged neighborhood, but that is exactly what happened. It included women and children who would pass the border. Some of them spent a long time in detention. Some of them spent a short time in detention, depending on how many people arrived straight after. 
um, and then they would be sent to Tel Aviv. And during this time, it's a big time of being in complete legal limbo. It's unclear, do people have the right to work? Do they not have the right to work? Is there any social rights, health rights, housing? It was all uh, a complete situation of limbo. But despite that, people found jobs, they found housing, they, some people started families, they started living in Israel, as you do. Um, but all the time, there was tension building. And whilst the government were watching it and they were talking about it, there was very little planning that went on until there was a complete backlash. And in 2012, the government passed something called the Anti-Infiltration Law. The Anti-Infiltration Law is originally from the 1950s. It was called the Third Amendment to the Anti-Infiltration Law. The first two amendments of the law were um, from the early years of the state, and they were to uh, stop Palestinians from coming back into the newly formed state, some of whom were coming in and uh, doing terror attacks in the early 1950s, some of whom were trying to go back to their villages. And the law said that anyone who enters Israel, not through a valid border crossing, such as Ben Gurion Airport, and is not a resident of the state of Israel, is an infiltrator, and they can be detained until they're deported. And so by attaching the idea of infiltrators to this historical idea of terrorists, it really did that association in the minds of many Israelis. You can hear there is a drastic um, difference in the language between asylum seekers who have the right to seek asylum from fleeing persecution and infiltrators who are, in a sense, a terror threat. Um, and in the years of, uh, in the last few years, this has really been the dominant discourse. Infiltrators, migrant workers, terrorists, anything but refugees. And it has been extremely successful in confusing the public. Sometimes you open a newspaper article and it uses the words refugee, migrant worker, terrorist, infiltrator, all in the one article. The idea that these people are not refugees is incredibly convenient. It would be very convenient if these people were not refugees because under international law then, there is no obligation. But there is a reason why they're still in Israel because Sudanese and Eritreans have something called group protection, okay? The country will not forcibly deport them to their country of origin. So. Amongst the Sudanese and Eritreans, there were some people who came in from other countries. And according to the law of Israel, and like many other countries, if you're in the country unlawfully and you're not seeking asylum, you can be deported, and people are deported. But Sudanese and Eritreans are different. The country, Israel acknowledges that those specific people are in danger, and therefore they will not forcibly deport them to their country of origin. Why? Well, although there might be refugees from other countries, people who are seeking asylum and they can submit an application for asylum, it's acknowledged that all Sudanese and Eritreans are in danger because Eritreans are in danger for the fact that they left. That's illegal. Sudanese, many of them, the majority in Israel are from the Darfur region where they fled genocide. Many of them were politically active on behalf of um, the Darfur people. But the moment they entered Israel, because Israel is an enemy country, they are in danger. Back in 2005, there were um, seven Sudanese who were in Israel. They were then sent to Jordan. Jordan sent them back to Sudan. And they were publicly ex executed for being spies for the Zionist regime. So Sudanese and Eritreans have group protection. It's something that other countries had at different stages. Um, at one point, people from Sierra Leone and Ivory Coast were also under group protection in Israel. <coughs> and in the very early days of the state of South Sudan, which got independence from Sudan in 2012, they also had group protection. 
But at some point, Israel decided the new country of South Sudan was safe, and all of the South Sudanese were deported. At the time, some of them wanted to leave. Some of them wanted to go back to their newly independent country. Others didn't. They had no confidence that it would be safe, um, and they were forcibly deported, including children who had lived in Israel for five, seven years and felt Israeli. Um, they were sent back to South Sudan, um, which soon broke out into be becoming a war zone. So one of the things during the years is that Israel decided if we can't send them back to their country of origin, we're going to try and send them somewhere else. So part of this anti-infiltration law that was established in 2012 was the opening of something called the Hulot Detention Center. And Mr. Eli Ishai, who was the interior minister at 2012, stated very clearly what the intention was. He said, if we can't deport them, we will make their lives miserable until they choose to voluntarily leave. And so what would happen was people would be summoned to the Hulot Detention Center and they would be given a nice brochure, in the other hand, which said, voluntary leave. You can, if you would like, go back to your country or go to another country that we have organized for you. Uh, we will pay for the flight ticket and we will also give you a $3,500 departure gift and uh, you can go um, and start your life there. The third country was never mentioned what it was. It was another African country that Israel had organized for them. As soon as Israel started sending people to third countries, we at the, the hotline, the organization where I work for, began monitoring what is really going on in these third countries. The state never said what the name is, even to people who were leaving. They never had any documentation until they arrived in the airport that said where they were going. And we knew that they were going to Uganda and Rwanda. Um, in 2005, we published our four first report about what happens to people who are returned to their country of origin or who are sent to their third country. And the picture was clear that it was not safety. At the same time that we published our first report, um, the government decided that they could step up the pressure to go to these third countries, that we can still continue to not forcibly send people to their country of origin, um, but we will forcibly send them to the uh, third country. So what they did was they passed a, uh, it was just a policy amendment saying that um, they are gonna issue deport deportation orders to the third countries and anyone who doesn't comply they're going to put them in a proper detention, closed detention, not like this open Hulot detention centre that they had created, in a proper closed detention centre uh, until they agree to leave. We went to court at the time um, saying that this is against the law on human dignity and liberty. This is a basic law in Israel. And... One of the things we did was submit testimonies to court about what is happening to those people in those third countries that we were able to collect. And at the time, the court said, this isn't enough evidence. So we sent a delegation to Uganda um, and they met with people who were, had been sent to Uganda and they also met with people who had been sent to Rwanda and had then been smuggled to Uganda. Um, we lost the case in the district court um, and it went to the Supreme Court. And we got the final judgment in August of last year, September. So we had been on hold for two and a half years. And the court said that putting people in detention indefinitely in order to gain their consent to leave cannot be considered consent. However, the court didn't say that deportations without consent is illegal. Um, it was a very strange period because we got a judgment and we thought we had won. We celebrated. And then two days later, we understood that this was not a good thing. There was an immediate backlash um, from politicians and they said, 
it's fine. We, we're going to amend the agreements with the third countries because the agreements had said that we'll just send people who want to go and we'll amend it so it says that we'll accept people who don't want to go. The agreements of these third countries are this uh, mystical thing that we talk about. You see, the entire court case about this happened based on these agreements that are classified. We're not actually able to see what is in the content of the agreements. And a lot of the court case took place in private between the state and the high court without our lawyers present. And the court said in the end, they've seen the content of the agreements and they're okay with it. No, they said it's not okay, but they allowed them to amend the agreements. And in October, um, the Prime Minister announced that he has amended the agreements with the third countries and they will soon start deporting people. Um, at the time, we also had more research going on about what is happening in the third countries. And in January this year, a report was published by some uh, researchers in Europe. They had conducted interviews with 19 people who had been deported to Rwanda, 18 of them to Rwanda, one to Uganda. And when they didn't find safety there, they were told their best thing to do was to be smuggled to go to Uganda. So they had been smuggled from Rwanda to Uganda, then to South Sudan, Sudan, Libya, across the Mediterranean and to Europe. Every single one of them had either been given refugee status in Europe or were waiting to hear uh, from their refugee claim in Europe. Where in Israel they had been called infiltrators over and over, in Europe they were found to be refugees. The report based on these 19 testimonies said the conclusion was that throughout the journey, the refugees were subject, subjected to human trafficking, incarceration, the threat of forcible deportation to Eritrea, harsh conditions of starvation, violence, slavery and torture camps in Libya, and a dangerous crossing of the Mediterranean Sea from Libya to Europe. Many witnessed the death of fellow travelers. Among the dead were others who had left Israel voluntarily. It says in the report that 18 of the 19 interviews were conducted in Hebrew. There is today in Europe a Hebrew-speaking Eritrean diaspora of people who lived for anywhere between five to ten years in Israel, who learned the language, who worked, who paid taxes, who lived amongst us, and then were sent away. In our continued advocacy work, we've tried to understand a bit more about what exactly is in the agreements. Um, according to the government of Rwanda, there are no agreements. They've tweeted to us <coughs> that in reference to the rumours that have been recently spread in the media, the government of Rwanda wishes to inform that it has never signed any secret deal with Israel regarding the relocation of African migrants. It's not the only tweet we got from them. The other one specifically said that the, uh, the, uh, the uh, news that they are accepting forcibly deported uh, refugees is fake news. Um, but since January 1st, the deportation orders have started to be issued and they say on them that Israel has organized a safe place in Africa, in a country that is in a stable economic uh, situation where they will be able to work. And the thing is, with all of these testimonies that was gathered, we almost didn't need to do that work. They hear through their own networks what happened to their peers who left. Um, likely you may have seen about what's going on in Libya with the, with the smuggling and the trafficking of people. That works, that, that works far stronger than any of the Israeli government's statement that we have organized a nice place for you to go. It speaks much harsher. And so one of the messages whenever we have had um, gathered testimonies, including testimonies that were put on Israeli TV by Hebrew-speaking Eritreans, said, whatever you do, 
don't do what we did. It's better to stay in prison in Israel than to, to leave to Rwanda. So I want to just tell you a little bit about who these people are. This is Mohammed. He's 19. The best food I ever ate was the hummus and jello, jello that the soldiers gave us when we crossed the border. This is the place where I grew up. I have no other place in the world. I studied computer science at school and now pass my psychometric exams. I want to study computer science. These guys came into Israel when they were still teenagers. So they've lived their formative years in Israel. I had this translated. The conversation all took place in Hebrew because that's their strongest language. Because they are now single men over the age of 18, which is the criteria for deportation, despite the fact that they have their parents and younger siblings in Israel, all of them are at risk of being deported now. They're both graduates of the Bialik Rogozin School. It's the local public school in South Tel Aviv um, where they learnt the history of the state of Israel and the Jewish people as you learn going through the public school system in Israel. Um, but since the big announcements of the deportation starting, it seems that there was some kind of line crossed. The idea of forced deportations has flicked a switch. Um, and people in Israel are starting to talk about it, and people in the US and around the world are starting to talk about it in a way that hasn't been spoken about before. Um, the first big names that came out with a big letter was on behalf of 35 leading Israeli authors um, last month who wrote a letter to the Prime Minister asking him to call, we call on you to act morally, humanely, and with compassion worthy of the Jewish people. Otherwise, we will have no reason to exist. The days afterwards were a letter by more and more different groups. So it started with the authors, then there was over 500 academics, over 1,000 doctors and others from the medical professions, uh, a list of school principals, a list of teachers, all calling on the government to stop this act. The one that really um, hit a nerve with a lot of people was the Holocaust survivors who got together um, to publicly oppose the deportation. And this is from uh, Yediot Achonot uh, newspaper. It says on the front, uh, Did we not learn anything from the Holocaust? And uh, below the title is the text from one particular Holocaust survivor saying, I always ask myself what I would have done during the Holocaust if I had been on the other side. Will I have been strong enough to do what the righteous among the nations did? Even though it is different, I feel that to save refugees from this deportation, that is my humanitarian responsibility. One of the strongest uh, voices I saw, and there have been um, many uh, opinion pieces as well um, from different uh, public intellectuals and public figures, um, was from Professor Yehuda Bauer. He's uh, one of the world-leading Holocaust historians, and he was the president of Yad Vashem. And he wrote a stirring piece and he said, we must appeal to those who stand to carry out the deportations. The police officers who will arrest the refugees, the population authority officials, the bus drivers who will transport them, the airline pilots who will fly the deportees and the ground crew at Ben Gurion International Airport. What you are being asked to do violates national and human morality. Don't do it. The claim that you just followed orders and are just government workers will not help you. It reminds us too much of the similar situation in the past. An order from above does not free one from moral responsibility. Your grandchildren ask, will ask, what did you do, grandma and grandpa? So right now in Israel, we're at a very, possibly one of the peak uh, times of of uh, tension regarding this issue. Um, I've been working in this field for almost four years and I, I don't think it's ever been as um, imminent as it is right now. It's in the newspapers every single day, um, whether it's about the agreements with the Rwanda, whether it's about new testimonies that are coming about, um, or whether it's about new initiatives of people opposing the deportation. Um, 
three days ago, the leading article on Yediot, which is the most mainstream, widely read newspaper other than Israel Ayom, um, was about a guy, uh, an Eritrean guy, who had left to Rwanda. He'd, he had uh, been deported. He had also traveled along that route to Europe and is now living in Berlin. He works at a restaurant owned by Israelis um, where he speaks Hebrew to them. And he said quite clearly to his friends, stay in prison if you have to. Even though I'm safe here in Berlin now, I wouldn't go back to what I chose. Um, the fight in all of this is not over. As I said, a switch was turned and I don't think the government expected that at all. Um, there is a lot of work to be done on this. Next week, um, there's gonna be a protest in Tel Aviv, including many people in South Tel Aviv who um, are angry that the government is using the argument that we need to do this for the purpose of improving South Tel Aviv. They're, they don't want this to be done on their name. There are people in South Tel Aviv who want this done, and then there are people who won't have this happen in their name. There's legal work to be done. Um, we have about 12 different cases that are waiting um, on behalf of different groups of vulnerable people who we will submit cases for. For example, people who arrived as unaccompanied minors, people who um, finished school in the education system, like uh, Belha and Muhammad, who I just spoke about. Uh, there are asylum seekers who are HIV positive, who have disabilities, who are survivors of torture. Um, we're gonna be having a legal cases for each and every one of these groups. Um, but that's at the same time as there's also plenty of public work going on and campaigning. Um, and hopefully it will still change the, the decision of the government. Um, what's more important now than ever is reminding ourselves that this is an opportunity for us. Many of these people, despite everything that has happened in Israel, have had some kind of positive experience in Israel in the last five to 10 years. Unlike in a lot of places where asylum seekers are put to the side and told to wait for their answers, in Israel they just had to go out and start life. And most asylum seekers have some kind of connection to Israelis or to Israeli society, whether it's their bosses, their colleagues, um, their neighbors, most of them speak Hebrew, they have connections to, to Israel and have had some kind of positive um, association. Uh, there has been a few major cases where we have had um, big groups of refugees come to us, come with us to the high court and sit in the court. And for people who come from non-democratic countries where they had no freedom of speech, to be able to go to court and sit in the high court and sometimes to win in the high court is an incredibly empowering experience. And I know that I've seen, uh, there's a one guy, Anwar, he's from Darfur, and he saw one of the high court judges one, one night in Tel Aviv. It was actually at an art exhibition. And he went up to her and he said, it was after some of the judgments that were in our favor, and he went up to her and said, thank you for your brave judgments. Wherever I go in the world, I know I will have learned about democracy from here in Israel. Um, so I wanna just leave you with this line um, from Pirkei Avot, which I, always comes to me when I think about the refugee issues. Uh, that it is not your responsibility to finish the work of perfecting the world, but you are not free to desist from it either. Israel is not going to be the answer to the world's refugee crisis, but neither can we turn our eyes to it. Right now there are 37,000 asylum seekers who need our assistance. Um, they are the people who are already amongst us and have lived with us for five to ten years. Um, and I call on all of you to engage with this, to talk to people about what you've learned today, um, and to share what you've learned in order to make sure that no matter what, there are people like Anwar who will say wherever they go, but there were people who always stood up for me. There were people who supported us. Um, so now, questions.
Um, look, the policy of third country deportation came in in early 2015, and then we were in the court for two and a half years. Um, when it came out again in um, when we kind of lost the judgment late last year. And I think there are a few factors that really play into this that are not obvious ones, um, but are there. Firstly, when they got the judgment uh, just a few months ago, there is a feeling that deporting the refugees is popular. And this is one of the reasons why all of the public figures speaking out gives me a lot of hope. Because I think the government do it because they think it's popular. And if they realize it's not popular, that is, the, that is that. I don't believe that it is the number one priority for anyone in the government. This is not the cartel issue, for example, where what Jews around the world say doesn't matter because there is a party in the Knesset who no matter what will put their foot down to, to not see things change. Refugee issues are no one's number one priority and that's why I think this is winnable. But Bibi's under a lot of pressure and he's under the impression that deporting refugees is popular. The court judgment made it allowable. And um, the nature of the global leadership is such that no one's going to uh, stop them from the American side. So on this particular issue, it was policy. But over the years, there, there's been the anti-infiltration law and then, then the court over, uh, overturned the law and it went back and it went back. And um, There are politicians who are with us, definitely. There are politicians from the joint list, Meretz, Labour, Yeshatid, even Kulanu, who are with us and who have spoken to our issues like and to our cause over and over for the last 10 years. Um, but yeah, they are the minority. Um, but the reason why I do think it is winnable is because even for those majority who are for it, I don't believe any of them that it's their number one issue. And for them, they were told to vote on party lines and that's it. And that's what they do. And that's, I think, to be honest, one of the major messages here. I think one of the successes of all these people speaking out was um, an article a few weeks ago that the uh, Israeli ambassador to the US told Bibi, this is making headaches for me. I think that is one of the things that can really affect this more than anything. If this is creating problems for exactly um, as much as I hate to say it, that is going to be one of the... the the things that will influence in the end. Um, can you just like tell us about your experience out through here in Sudan, across the Sinai Desert, and through Egypt, and just to the Israeli border? I don't feel there's really been a mystery to me, especially since the Egyptian government uh, uh, considered him a menace and is going to uh, try to uh, deceive him. Uh, is this still something that is currently going on? Is that specifically, or is that the administration uh, is still occurring right now? Um, yeah. It's a good point because I left that out. Um, in 2012, when they passed the anti-infiltration law, they also built a fence on the on the uh, Sinai border. And I think it's one of the things that really kind of morally makes this a very clear-cut situation, um, that there's no one coming in anymore. Uh, in the last two years, there's been zero entries. Um, but in 2012, they finished building the border fence in, like, November, and you, we can see the numbers. The ministry, it's public information. The Ministry of Interior releases the number of people who ended, and you can see that when they finished the fence, it went like this. There were other influencing factors. The Sinai became extremely dangerous. Um, what began as a smuggling route became a trafficking route where people were being held and tortured for ransom. Um, it became very uh, profitable to hold humans. Um, for ransom, and that made the Sinai extremely dangerous, as well as which the migratory route to Europe opened up a lot more. 
Um, there was previously an agreement of turning boats back from Libya to Italy. And the European court overrode that and the, the road to Europe opened up again. Um, and to be honest, I think also the word got out that Israel was not as they had hoped. Um, so for whatever all those reasons are, and the irony is that the government often say, um, you know, even if I look back just... Um, um, Israel must not be flooded with infiltrators. I mean, this is 2015. This is two years after the border fence had been closed. In fact, in terms of talking about policy of what the government intended and what happened, it was very successful. They closed the border and people stopped coming. So, okay, um, we're talking about 30, 37,000, which sounds, it sounds like a lot, but, but it's not in terms of, it's less than half of 1% of the population. It's 0.4 of a, a population percentage point. And the thing is that people often think, what are we going to do 37,000 non-Jews? But Israel is not this homogenous 100% Jewish society. It's 70 to 75% Jewish. And I don't think that less than half of 1% of the population, therefore, is a real danger factor to that. On top of which, their working community. Like, I work for one of the organizations that um, represent and work with the community. We do legal aid and litigation. And there are a few other NGOs that are key are part of this. But amongst all of us, there's almost no material aid handed out. There is very, very little, you know, um, food and clothing handed out. There is no shelter or accommodation. What? There's no highest. There's, no highest. <laughs> there's none of that. So the government is not putting money in. Actually, they're, they're filling a role in the economy. The, um, one of the things that I think again, unintentional, but I think played a big influence, is that Israel has a major labor shortage. There's not enough people to do the jobs that need to be done. And they have come to fulfill that role. In fact, in all of this, one of our strongest partners have been the employers. M less the construction industry and the hospitality, because the construction industry have a migrant worker visa category. So construction companies can um, get migrant workers from abroad, and they do. They're, there's a lot of Chinese coming now to work in um, construction. Um, but the hospitality industry doesn't. So the hotels and the restaurants, if you go in Tel Aviv now, there isn't a single restaurant or hotel that doesn't have an Eritrean cleaning the dishes in the kitchen. And actually, to be honest, the one um, turn in all of this that scared me more than anything is when the Minister for Tourism said, it's okay, we'll bring new Filipinos to wash the dishes. That to me said, okay, that's really, like, that was for me the scary moment. It said to me, this could, could really happen. Um, so they're not an economic burden, they're actually an economic plus. They're not a demographic problem. Um, there is one problem, though, that they're highly concentrated in one socio, one low socioeconomic neighbourhood, um, and that is a real problem. Um, and there are there are ways to help the population disperse, and that's what we advocate for. Um, and certainly, uh, there is yeah one neighbourhood that has been negatively affected by this migration, but it's not the migration itself; it's the bad management of it. Um, that led to that situation. Um, just to turn to the very beginning of your talk, and like just because I've been sitting with me the whole time, when you mentioned that there are Vietnamese people living in Israel who are still getting their their uh, settlement, I forget the exact term yeah. you used for their visas, that they're still getting them renewed and they've been there, what, like 40 years now? 77. Yeah, 77, in almost a, like a little over 40 years. And like, 
this is something that I've always wondered about. Like, the path, I mean, I'm, like, pretty sure that there's not really a path to citizenship for just, like, people who aren't Jewish in Israel, but, like, what about the children, like, there are now, like, 40-year-old people who were born in Israel who are Vietnamese. Like, but the Ethiopians are Filipino. But, Phil- but they're, they're Jewish. Filipino children. But the Ethiopians are Jewish. The Filipino are married. They're, they're not Jewish. They're not right, Jewish but, because right, but I'm just wondering, okay. like, the okay in terms of the Vietnamese, I think there was they they got residency and then there was something like um, when the children turn eighteen, if they go to the army, they can get citizenship, and then from that their parents can turn to it. So I know that that's something that we were helping with trying to change the status. But I mean the thing about the Vietnamese and also the groups of Filipino kids who were given status is they were one-time humanitarian decisions. Um, so there isn't necessarily, it was done like as a policy, it wasn't through the court, it wasn't a precedent that has to apply to anyone else. Um, in terms of what you said about path to citizenship, um, there are 10, 11 Sudanese and Eritreans who have um, been granted refugee status, but we're not at the stage of knowing even if refugee status does have a path to citizenship. To be honest, it's not really something that we've majorly dealt with because it's seems less urgent for those 11 people than than the rest um but in israeli law as it currently stands like somebody who's not a refugee like let's say that there's some christian who lives here and like gets a job as an academic at Tel university and then wants to live there and become a citizen and like whatever what no i mean i start okay, that's what i thought i start yeah i started by saying the law of return has is israel's migration policy There is a right for Israelis to bring their partners. It's a long process for them to get, um, uh, what's the word, naturalized to be their own, and it depends completely on the relationship. So if the relationship breaks down, the partner is not allowed to stay in the country. Um, But yeah, the path to citizenship in Israel is for Jews. And to be honest, as someone who's been a beneficiary of that policy, it's not something that I really have the greatest problem with. But I do think there is a specific spot that needs to be for people who are seeking asylum from persecution. And I really think that, you know, uh, um, Ed, you raised this question of it's a lot of people, is it not? I think in the end that the question about the Jewish country has become so uh, entwined with the question about demographics and it needs to come back to a question about values as well. And if protecting 37,000 asylum seekers is not something that we can do as a Jewish country, then it really requires us to think what exactly that means. Um, You said that um, a lot of people have grown up here and their families and everything. Can you picture the town of their house that they're only in? Oh, that's true, because I made the presentation to here. Um, it's for the, like, international media. I, there is, uh, listen, this week there's been uh, protests actually outside of the Rwandan embassy. Um, and there was protests held all over the world outside the Rwandan embassy, small ones in Berlin and in uh, a couple of places in Europe. And it was amazing to me to see these Eritreans in Europe holding signs in Hebrew. I mean, to, to be honest, there's something about them speaking Hebrew and especially speaking Hebrew after deportation that really um, touches me because I think of Hebrew as one of the the core center of modern Jewish life. And I, when I go down to Bialik Rogozin School in South Tel Aviv and I see these um, Sudanese and Eritrean and Filipino kids speaking Hebrew to one another, I think that you know, Eliezer ben Yura, the founder of the modern Hebrew language, would have been overjoyed to see the situation there today. Um, but yeah, there, I mean, look, not everyone speaks perfect Hebrew, um, but some of them do. There's, there is a very small amount of um, students who are studying in university. They are kind of like the people who are doing well. Um, look, I, I would say as a whole, like the community is 
is reasonably doing okay. I mean, they're a working community. Even people with disabilities who can't work are normally being looked after within the community by friends and family, etc. But the, the students who have made it into university are, are really an impressive bunch and they're all studying in Hebrew. But I want to let people go because I see people are leaving. Thank you all so much for coming.